Chemical Equilibrium, Part 4, The Reaction Quotient. This video will show you how to solve equilibrium problems and to find the equilibrium position, that is, the concentration of reactants and products at equilibrium. We'll also take a look at the reaction quotient and how to calculate it to predict which direction the reaction will shift in order to come to equilibrium. The equilibrium constant and the equilibrium uh, expression will allow us to predict several things about a chemical reaction. One of those things is the tendency of the reaction to occur. That's something we'll look at later in a discussion of thermodynamics. The others will be considered in this video. Whether a given set of concentrations represents a reaction at equilibrium and how to determine the equilibrium position from a given set of initial conditions. Let's look at a model to help us understand how to find equilibrium concentrations. Here's a reaction in which three blue dot molecule reacts with a red and blue dot molecule to form a two blue dot molecule and a two blue dot one red dot molecule. Let's assume the equilibrium constant is 16 and the initial concentrations are nine three blue dot molecules and 12 red and blue dot molecules. The equilibrium expression shown here will allow us to figure out what the equilibrium position is. Since we're only dealing with 25 particles, we could use trial and error to figure it out. What if five molecules of each reactant reacted? Would the reaction then be at equilibrium? If five molecules of each reactant were consumed to produce five molecules of each product, then the concentrations would be 4, 7, 5, and 5, respectively. Plugging these numbers into the equilibrium expression only gives a value of 0.9. This system is not at equilibrium because 0.9 is not 16, the equilibrium constant for this reaction at this temperature. The system must shift to the right to produce more products because 0.9 is less than point, excuse me, is less than 16. That would increase the numerator in the ratio and decrease the denominator, increasing the value of the equilibrium expression which is what needs to happen for 0.9 to get to 16. What then would be the equilibrium concentrations? If we let x be the number of molecules that must react before equilibrium is, is achieved, then we can write the equilibrium, the equilibrium expression using x, set it equal to the equilibrium constant k, and solve for x. In calculations such as these, X is known as the extent of the reaction because it expresses how much the reaction needs to shift to the left or to the right. In our example, the concentration of equilibrium then would be 9 minus x, 12 minus x, x, and x, respectively. Trial and error or some algebra would lead us to the result that x is equal to 8. If x is 8, then the equilibrium expression equals 16, the equilibrium constant and the equilibrium concentrations for each reaction and product, excuse me, each reactant and product could be determined. This process is the basic process for calculating the equilibrium position for a chemical reaction when given the equilibrium constant and a set of equilibrium conditions. In the previous example, we used the law of mass action to see if our conditions were equilibrium conditions. But what we were actually calculating is called the reaction quotient. Q is used to represent a system by applying the law of mass action to a system that is not at equilibrium. If Q is equal to K, then the system is at equilibrium. If Q is greater than K, then the system will shift to the left, producing more reactants in order to achieve equilibrium. If Q is less than K, then the system will shift to the right, producing more products in order to achieve equilibrium. Solving equilibrium problems typically involves finding the equilibrium position in terms of concentrations or pressures when given the value for the equilibrium constant and a set of initial conditions as either concentrations or pressures. Solving these problems will often require employing several strategies such as stoichiometry, algebra, the quadratic equation, and an organizational chart called an ice table. Let's look at four examples that require these strategies. Consider an experiment in which gaseous dinitrogen tetroxide 
which decomposes to form gaseous nitrogen dioxide, is placed in a flask and allowed to reach equilibrium at a temperature where Kp is equal to 0.133. If the equilibrium partial pressure of dinitrogen tetroxide was found to be 2.71 atmospheres, what is the equilibrium pr pressure of nitrogen dioxide? This equilibrium expression can be written according to the law of mass action. By substituting the partial pressure of dinitrogen tetroxide at equilibrium and the equilibri equilibrium constant's value, we can solve for the partial pressure of nitrogen dioxide. The partial pressure of nitrogen dioxide at equilibrium is 0 0.600 atmospheres. Most equilibrium problems do not include information about the system at equilibrium, however. For example, what is the equilibrium position for this equilibrium between carbon monoxide and water, which react to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen? At 700 Kelvin, the equilibrium constant is 5.10, and 1.000 mole of each species is initially mixed together in a 1.000 liter flask. We'll start by considering whether the reaction is already at equilibrium by calculating the reaction quotient. Remember that the reaction quotient can be calculated by substituting in the initial concentrations into the law of mass action. Since Q for this reaction under these conditions is 1, and that is less than K, then the reaction must proceed to the right, forming more products before it reaches equilibrium. We'll continue this problem by creating an ice table. Ice is a mnemonic for initial, change, and equilibrium. The initial concentration of each species is written underneath it in the balanced equation like so. Since this reaction shifts to the right, then the concentration of each reactant will change by subtracting x, the, the extent of the reaction, and the concentration of each product will change by adding x. We can then write out these expressions for the equilibrium concentrations and substitute them into the equilibrium expression. In this case, the right side of the equal sign is a perfect square, so we can take the square root of each side to simplify the equation. Once we solve for x, we see that the extent of this reaction is 0.387. This can then be substituted into the E row of our ice table to determine the equilibrium concentrations of each species, that is, the equilibrium position. So at, it, it, at equilibrium, the concentrations of carbon monoxide and water are 0.613 molar and the concentrations of carbon dioxide and hydrogen are 1.387 molar. Let's use another ice table to solve this equilibrium problem. In this balanced reaction between hydrogen and iodine, an equilibrium is established forming hydrogen iodide. Note that this equation is not a simple 1 to 1 to 1 mole ratio for the balanced equation. That will affect the algebra a little bit, but the process we used before will work here too. With all these initial partial pressures and an equilibrium constant in terms of pressure equal to 100, what will be the equilibrium pressures of all species? First, let's compare Q to K and discover which direction the reaction will shift in order to come to equilibrium. That requires substituting in the initial partial pressures to find the reaction quotient. The reaction quotient, Q, is equal to Since Q is greater than K, the reaction must shift to the left and form more reactants before equilibrium is established. 
Here is our ice table with the initial pressures already filled out. For the change row, we have to not only consider that this reaction is shifting to the left side, but we must also consider the stoichiometry of the balanced equation. Each reactant will increase pressure by adding x, but the product will decrease by 2x because 2 moles of hydrogen iodide are consumed to form every 1 mole of each reactant. The equilibrium partial pressures would then be representing by these, represented by these green expressions, which can then be substituted into the equilibrium expression to solve for x. To solve for x, we must expand the top of the expression and expand the bottom of the expression. Multiplying the bottom of the right side by both sides of the equations will make it easier to combine like terms and eventually reach this equation. 96x squared plus 3.5x minus 0.245 equals 0. This is a quadratic equation that will allow us to use the quadratic formula to solve for x. Using the quadratic formula will give us two solutions, but one of those will always not make sense in the context of the problem. Beware, it's not always the negative solution, because sometimes students forget to consider whether the reaction will shift to the left or the right. Here we will see that one of the solutions can be thrown out because it doesn't make any sense, leaving the value for x, which can then be substituted into the equilibrium partial pressures from the E row of the ice table. This allows us to determine the equilibrium partial pressures for all three species. Our next equilibrium problem would result in some tricky math by producing a cubic function in order for us to solve for x. While not impossible, we can avoid the more complex algebra by making an approximation because the next equilibrium problem will have a very small equilibrium constant. Whenever k is small, the extent of the reaction x is typically so small that it does not significantly change the concentration of some species in the reaction. You should always carefully verify the validity of such approximations, though, by calculating k afterward and check to make sure that it matches the k from the problem. This reaction at 35 degrees Celsius has an equilibrium constant of 1.6 times 10 to the negative fifth. If the reaction starts with a 0 0.50 molar nitroso chloride and nothing else, what are the equilibrium concentrations of all three species? Because this reaction has a small value for K, it will favor the reactants and only produce a little bit of the products. Using the law of mass action, we see that the reaction quotient here is going to be zero, which is less than the equilibrium constant. As a result, the reaction will of course shift to the right. It couldn't have shifted to the left because there weren't any products present when the reaction started so it had to shift to the right anyway. We'll use another ice table to set up this problem. The stoichiometry of the reaction and the fact that it shifts to the right means that nitroso chloride will decrease by 2x while nitric oxide increases by 2x and chlorine by x. Here are our equilibrium concentrations in terms of x shown in green. Once we substitute into the equilibrium expression, we should notice that K is much smaller than the initial concentration of nitroso chloride. As a result, the equilibrium concentration of nitroso chloride will be approximately the same as its initial concentration. Using this approximation, we can solve a simpler equation for the value of x. Having found x, by substituting into the expressions from the E row of the ice table, we can find each species' equilibrium concentration. With the equilibrium position, we can use the law of mass action to verify that these concentrations are equilibrium concentrations, which in this case checks out well enough.
I hope that these examples have helped you to solve equilibrium problems. If you have difficulty with the equilibrium problems, please review this video and the associated pages in your textbook. Leave a note in the comments if you have any questions. Thanks again.